It's uh, about time to start uh, this uh, section, uh, the breakout session on uh, regated uh, uh, ag. Uh, my name is Kefi Desta. I am with Washington State University. Uh, I'm located at Prosser uh, Irrigated Agriculture Research and Extension Center. I'm a soil scientist or simply a dirt man for irrigated crops uh, in that region. Uh, this morning, uh, the, uh, this session is hosted by uh, my uh, home department, uh, Crop and the Soil Sciences, Washington State University. Uh, we are hoping uh, that basically this uh, session is uh, designed uh, to give you some highlight and we have a very good presentation uh, uh, this morning. And I hope we'll take one or two things with you as you leave from this room. Uh, our presenter this morning is uh, uh, Ron Andrews, and Ron is uh, a graduate of Central uh, Washington University, and uh, he worked as a consultant for very long and in many crops, and right now he's uh, working for uh, Will Barales in uh, uh, Odessa, Washington. With this, uh, uh, I think um, uh, Roy wants you to ask questions as he go, so, and he's gonna give you more, and he got also uh, some materials for you on the table. Now I, uh, uh, I invite uh, Roy to take over. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody this morning. Uh, I see a lot of faces I seen last night. Anyway, I work out of Odessa, Washington for Wilbur Ellis. Uh, our canola acreage up here has been increasing year after year after year. And what we're gonna be talking about this morning is irrigated uh, canola. Um, and most of the stuff we have up there is winter canola. We do have a little bit of spring, but not nearly as much as we do winter canola. Slide, please. One of the things I want to caution you with this morning, I don't know if you can see all that up there, is every year we have people come up to us and go, yeah, I'm going to put canola out here. Well, what did you put on there? Well, I use PowerFlex. Well, look at the plant back restrictions on that. PowerFlex, nine months. Gold Sky, 16 months. Outrider or Maverick, 22 months. Olympus, 22 months. Osprey, 22 months. Curtail, five months. Raptor or Beyond, five months. Metro Buesner, Syncor. I mean, a lot of guys are going behind potatoes. It's not going to work because you've had Syncor on there or Metro Buesen on there. It's just going to you got about 18 month plant back. Husky, nine months. Orion, uh, nine months. And Valor, four months. So you got to be really careful. And you know, I mean, you got to plan this out. You can't just say, I'm going to put canola in here. Well, it doesn't work because you, you don't have enough time to plant back. You're going to have problems. And what happens is the canola actually comes up, looks real nice, and then, but it never seems to put on any seed head at all especially with the SUs, unless you have an SU tolerant uh, variety. These are the main topics I'm going to talk to you about this morning. The uh, plea plant herbicides, uh, post plant herbicides, fall nutrients and soil amendments, spring uh, herbicides and nutrients, fungicide sprays, insect, insect sprays and nutrients, pre-harvest sprays and defoliation, and controlling volunteer canola and winter wheat. Next slide, please. Uh, first of all, you know, you start out, you're going to take a soil sample, get, you know, see what's in your soil. One of the two of the ones that I really, really pay a lot of attention to would be boron is really important, and sulfur is very important. And there's a lot of studies and stuff done on, on both of these products or these nutrients, and I mean, they're very, very important. And we'll cover them as we go along. And you can see on this one here, they'll give you the recommendations, what they, you know, what they want. You know, really pay attention to, uh, especially in our area, we have a problem with uh, sodium. Because of the deep wells we have up there, we have a lot of sodium in the soil. And you're going to have to do something, either gypsum or some kind of amendment to, to neutralize that, that sodium that's in the soil. Because, I mean, you can see for yourself, I mean, if you drink salt water, what happens to you, it just desiccates you. And, so it takes so much more water to, to actually grow up 
a plant with that high sodium level. If you've got a real high sodium level, I'd stay away from canola in there, mix I do. Again, here's the recommendations they have for that. 174 pounds in, they were kind of low on the boron. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I'd waste my money putting boron on dry. I mean, with, with a pound of boron, you're only getting what, probably what, 10, 10 pounds. If we spread that over an acre, you're getting a little prill here and a little prill there. You're not getting enough to supply the plant's needs and it needs boron. And there's a timing issue on that. Again, seedling uh, uh, consideration. Uh, date in around, in, it's about September in the Odessa area. Drills, there's, which one's the right drill? I mean, you guys have seen all the different stuff out here. You're gonna have to make up your own mind, you know, what, what kind of drill you wanna use. We like to get a really good seed bed up there started and then and plan into that. And then rate will vary depending on seed size, drill, calibration, etc. Variety selection, you know, consider previous herbicide applications, weeds and stuff like that. So if, if you, there are SU resistant varieties that would be soil resistant, not can't spray an SU on it, but and then the clear field varieties, which would be the uh, Raptor. Uh, so I mean, you know, if you have Raptor, you had peas or something like that, you know, one of those varieties would be really, you know, really good for that situation. Next slide. Please. Just a picture of a typical drill that most of the guys use in, in our area. Okay, let's do into our pre-plant herbicides. Uh, basically, um, most guys go out and put Roundup on, try to get rid of the cheat grass and, and any weeds and stuff that are growing before they plant. It's a real good idea. Again, if you're using a, a, uh, a Roundup ready variety, you know, you can probably skip this point or this deal here. Excellent. Post plant herbicides. Uh, in our area up there, we have a lot of volunteer wheat and we have a real cheat grass problem. So we've been, we've been using uh, uh, volunteer or select. You gotta watch the volunteer label. I mean, most of the labels on those uh, clethodim products like that uh, have higher rates than on canola. You can only go six ounces. So you gotta be careful. I mean, most people go 10, 12 ounces with, with select, but on volunteer, you have to go six ounce rate on that. Uh, post another product you can use however it's kind of kind of weak on downy brome or cheat grass and you know one of the recommendations they make in the book you know a sure to we've used that in our area up there and it, it doesn't get wild oats it's really poor on on cheat grass and pretty poor on volunteer wheat we just you know the rep in our area up there just said hey go, go to something different just it's not working in this area. I mean, it does not control wild oats. I mean, it just stunts them, sets it back, but they still seem to keep growing. So if you have a wild oat problem, stuff like that, stay away from the sure too. Next slide, please. Fall nutrients. Again, soil test prior to planting to determine plant needs. Uh, again, really pay attention to your, to your boron and, and sulfur levels. If you got low sulfur, you know, put it on right there with an ammonium sulfate or something like that. Stay away from the elemental sulfur because it takes too long to break down. It won't become available to the plant when it needs it. Uh, canola plants really like sulfur, so keep your sulfur levels up. What we do up in our area, we've been doing it the last couple of years. We've been using a product called Tillet Green Zone which is a 626-6, and it's a really high concentration of, of uh, organophosphates, so you're gonna get immediate action on it. A lot of guys will, will go down and put phosphate down in the, in the fall. In our soils up there, what happens is that uh, the phosphate, polysulfate, uh, reacts to the calcium in the soil and turns into calcium phosphate. 
which is what your teeth are made out of. So the plants uh, don't get to have any response to that. So I mean, you may put down 30 or 40 pounds of phosphate, you probably only get, utilize about, well, probably 10% of that. So you're gonna have a problem with a, with a phosphate deficiency. So we, what we're doing up there is we, uh, we have a product called, also called Safe Zone, which is, uh, goes in and it, it flocculates the soil, opens it up, lets the, lets the soil breathe, lets the canola come up really, really fast. Yeah, and it, it actually helps with the root system because it's able to, to work down into the soil. So we put both of those on in the, in the fall of the year, our last watering. I got some pictures I'll show you of it. <clears throat> this is uh, treated with one gallon of green zone and one quart of safe zone. Same with this one, treated with one gallon of uh, a green zone and one quart of safe zone. This is uh, also, this is actually that same field in December after we had some very, very low temperatures. And you can see that, you know, it's still, there's still quite a bit of green out there. So the plant health has helped it, you know, over winter a lot better and keeps it green longer, which is, you know, developing the root system a lot better. It makes it uh, a sturdier, hardier plant. This is a field just right across the road from it. This had no treatment on it. I tried to talk the guy into doing it, and he goes, ah, I put enough phosphate down, I'm not going to put any more phosphate down. And this is what it looked like after that real heavy frost we had. Here's another field treated the same way. One gallon of uh, green zone, one quart of safe zone. And then in December, it was, it was basically the same thing. I mean, it still was pretty healthy and green. Looks really good. You can see that other field, if you can see that, in the background where the telephone lines are, this is the field that was treated and the one on the other side of the road, you can see how light color it looks. That was the one in that previous picture. So there's a really remarkable difference. And one of the growers that on that first slide I showed you, he called me up and he goes, what's, what's going on here? I, said, well, I thought maybe we had a real serious problem. He goes, I've been driving around looking at canola. And he goes, mine, just looks, you know, just great. He says, some of this other stuff doesn't look very good. He said, what, what do you think, you know, attributed to that? And he goes, I said, well, we put, you know, the treatment on there. And he goes, well, I noticed on that, on that field, about five or six days after we put that through the center pivot, he said that stuff really took off, and really greened up, and looks really, really good. So now we'll go to the next slide. Uh, spring nutrients, we kind of repeat the same thing. Uh, most like say we're going to still after you put the select and stuff on you're still going to have problems with uh, with cheatgrass that, that didn't because it's only a contact material so stuff that comes up later the volunteer wheat over winter so it's a good idea to put another application of volunteer on at six ounces plus your other ingredients in their brimstone and R11 at that time when we're doing that too you know I talked to you about the boron needs in the in the plant an application of one quart of versatile uh, chelated uh, boron will mix just perfectly fine with uh, with your your select or volunteer in the past we had problems because of that most of the boron products were the pH on them was like 11 and it was neutralizing the the select or volunteer so with these chelated ones, they have a neutral pH and they don't affect the, the herbicides and stuff that you put on with it. Actually, also at that time, too, we can put a, we're spraying this on with a, with a rogator or airplane. We can put a fully grow boron, which there's pamphlets up here on that. It's uh, pretty much got all the, the nutrients in it. Uh, it's got 2% uh, nitrogen. 70% phosphate. These are all orthophosphates, so the plant utilizes them immediately. Uh, it's got potash, iron, chelated iron, magnesium, molybdenum, and, and zinc. So this is pretty much everything the plant needs. And then by adding the boron to that, we're getting a real response from that. 
and we've been putting, uh, at that time too, we also put another shot of the tillic green zone and safe zone to the center, center pivot. So that gives us our, what happens when the, you know, the plant goes through the winter, it gets beat up pretty good, the leaves start falling off. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, most of them are real purple looking, the, the leaves are purple. That's actually lack of phosphate. When you hit this combination on there, it'll just immediately pick that thing up. Just a shot of spraying it on. Irrigation management. One of the things you gotta watch when you're, when you're raising canola is you get too much water on there, you're gonna have a problem with sparatinia. You gotta, you gotta look those things over, just keep watching. I kind of watch for petal fall. And here's some of those fungicide options you have. Uh, it's really critical to scout the field in summer to determine the, the, if the fields are 20 to 50% bloom prior to petal fall. That's the timing that we put on. We've been, in our area, we've been using Quadris. Seems like it's about the cheapest one of the, of the group. Some of these are very, very expensive products. I mean, they all work very good, but, you know, $30 an acre, I mean, most guys, you know, kind of shudder at that. It's expensive enough with a Quadris. So what we've been going is uh, six to 15 fluid ounces of Quadris through the center pivot with one quart of R11. You can, you can chemigate Proline 480, which is a very, very good product. One they use a lot up in Canada and the Midwest. Uh, one of the new ones on the line right now is Creoxor. Uh, and mix that with Headline, but you're talking pretty good sized bucks there for doing that. And another new one from Dow right now is a product called Approach which has shown really good efficacy at, uh, for white mold sclerotinia control. However, that one there is gonna to have to probably go two to three applications to. They figured two was, was probably the best, best way to go with that. Some of the insects that you guys gotta be scouting for, uh, probably early in the, in the fall, uh, if you start seeing plants that look like they're dying, most of the time those are cut worms in the soil they seem to come in patches. I mean, I've seen one field up there about three years ago where they just took the whole field out. There was nothing left. <clears throat> Another one is, uh, of course, most of you guys had an experience with, with the cabbage uh, aphid. Uh, we had two fields last year that were really bad. You can, you can look on the deal, it looks like kind of white material, fuzzy material on the, on the stems and pods. And I mean, they'll completely defoliate that top of that plant. And, and it, they just come overnight. I mean, you go in there one day and look, two days later you go and look and the plants are just covered with uh, cabbage aphid. Really, really destructive. Alfalfa loopers and army worms, cabbage loopers. Those are, you know, come in later on in the season when the, when the plants are putting on pods. It's usually late, probably late, to, uh, of summer, maybe like in spring when the plants are in you know, full vegetative growth, you'll start seeing holes and stuff in the leaves. Normally a, a, a canola plant has enough foliage on it, you know, that they really don't get that bad. If they really get bad, they'll start, you know, you'll see them pretty, pretty good in the field. The one in the, in the middle over here is false cinch bug. Have any of you guys in the room had a problem with that? Have you ever seen those things? They just started showing up last year. We had one grower up there that he harvested the field. It was all done and he, he called up and says, hey, he said, I didn't ask you guys to come out and spray my volunteer canola. So we we're looking at each other like, well, what? I don't remember spraying it either. So Donnie and Dick, our other field men, went out and looked and the ground was just covered with these false cinch bugs. And I mean, they completely defoliated that thing. I mean, it looked like somebody put Roundup on it. I mean, there was nothing. They ate, especially the China lettuce in the field. I mean, they just, they just defoliated that whole field. Anything that was out there was gone. But right next door to it, you know, our wheat fields and stuff like that with China lettuce and stuff in it, they wouldn't move across the road even in get close to that other, other fields. So, I mean, really watch out. Karen said she went back to, I think, Oklahoma or some places 
summer and some of the fields down in, in Oklahoma got hit with, with cinch bugs. And he said just almost defoliated the whole plant. So, and they built the numbers are just incredible. The ground was just black with these little cinch bugs. I mean, they're just everywhere, just millions of them. We can't figure out where they come from, how they, you know, pick that one field with all the canola we have up there. They were just pick that one field. And what happens with cinch bugs, they overwinter in your yard, in your shrubs and stuff like that. So knowing that they're there now, we're gonna have to really watch real close for them because I think they're gonna be a problem, you know, in, in the future. So we need to be scouting for them and checking to make sure that we don't have a problem with those in our fields. One of the, most of the people in our area up there, if we have a problem with, with uh, almost any one of these pests I just showed you, we've been using Warrior at uh, 1.9 fluid ounces an acre with one quart of, we've been putting the fully grow action in there because normally if you have a problem with, with these aphids, they, they zap the health out of the plant. So putting a foliar on it at that time will help offset some of the damage that these things cause. And it also, with the, the product, it'll buffer the water to make the water more active. And it, it really helps a lot. I mean, it, it's a good time to do it. Also at that time, there's some other things up here. There's a, some brochures on end demand up here, which is a, a kind of a slow release nitrogen that'll kind of just feed the plant for about two or three more weeks. It'll take care of all the nitrogen needs it needs right at that time. Harvesting canola. there's three major methods in our area. It's well, almost everything is swathed. Uh, some of them are using, you know, direct, direct cut. They'll you know, use a pusher or a, you know, just direct combine, raise the header up real high and, and go. But the thing is, when you're doing that, this shows some of the, the ways that they're harvested. Next slide, please. Okay, if you're on a pre-harvest spray and, and, and defoliation, it's really important if you're going to uh, you're going to direct, you know, cut the stuff with a combine. <clears throat> you want to make sure that you defoliate that, that plant. And what, what most of the guys in the area have been doing up there, they've been using spodnum or seed. There's a seed. There's another one that's on the market right now. It's supposed to be. Anybody know what that is? You know what it is, Jeremy? Pod seal, right. But well, I tried to get online and look and see if I could find that stuff, but it seems like it's most of it's done up in Canada. I can't I can't find a label or anything on it, but they've been using it on beans over in the Quincy area and they said it works ten times better than what uh, Spodnum does. So that would just keep your seed from shattering when you're when you're out there direct uh, direct harvesting. Again, defoliation will make sure that most of the plants are and then seeds are set. And any you know all the foliage is off, so it makes it a lot easier to to uh, direct cut it. This is going to be one of the problems, and you know, when our area we have a lot of uh, irrigated wheat, usually follows a canola. In this situation like that, uh, you're going to have to find a product that's going to take out that volunteer canola, and it is hard to control. It seems like us with in the aerial application business, we we have to be so careful of, of canola in the area yet try to kill it in a field. I mean, it is really, really tough to control. The one of my things, if you can tolerate a nine month rotation to whatever mm -hmm. your next crop's gonna be, uh, I found probably one of the best products for controlling volunteer canola is Orion. I've tried, I've tried all the rest of them. I just, it just, it seems like it just stunts them for about a week and then they come right back. But that Orion will just, it'll just annihilate them. It's a, probably, one of the best products for getting rid of volunteer canola. If uh, you're gonna plant a sensitive crop after that, we've been using Affinity Broad Spect and up the rate from five to, to eight tenths of an ounce. And that seems to do a pretty good job, but it's still not as good as what the Orion is. Some of the trials that Karen put on up in Jeff Scheibel's place, it's a really good tour. It was a lot of people there, a lot of questions and it's pretty neat to see right firsthand what Jeff's fields look like before harvesting. What the question was, what should the threshold be on cabbage aphid before you should start spraying? 
what I, what I normally do, if I see them out in the field, I spray them because the populations can take over I mean, within two or three days. I mean, it just, you cannot believe how many millions and millions of those things. They really, they, they really, I mean, they, they must be prolific breeders because I mean, they, I mean, just overnight, the land will be just covered with them. So, I mean, you really, you really got to scout and watch them close. Certain varieties seem to be more sensitive to them. I mean, they are attracted to them. I mean, you can have two or three circles right in a row and one, one field will just, you know, they'll just, uh, it, overnight, they'll just repopulate that field. And you kill them off and about two weeks later, here they come again. So it's, it's a scouting deal. You've got to continuously scout these fields for them. And you can't just do it on the edge of the field. You've got to walk either down. You can't, it's hard to get into the field that time of year because it's so, so dense. But, you know, go down the pivot road or something like that and look, sometimes they're in farther, not just on the edge of the field. I usually try to scout the, the predominant wind, so from the west or southwest, check those parts because they, they do move with the winds and they're attracted to the yellow color on the flowers. That's what attracts them to it. So when you usually get, start getting real heavy blooms when they start appearing. The question was, uh, what are the water needs, uh, rainfall needs, or what? How much water do you need? I'll let turn that over to my expert, Jeff. Um, in the fall, you know, it's all it's all about timing, and you know, with deep well irrigation, we're trying to spread every gallon of water over a lot of acres. So, depending on when you get the previous crop off, and you know, we normally seed around the fifth to the tenth of September in our area, so. There's a short window of time, but fall time, five to seven inches of water. And normally I like to do a lot of slow laps so you don't have a lot of evaporation. You know, the first lap's probably like uh, two and three quarters to three inches of water in one blast. So, you, so you're soaking it up pretty good. And then from there on, you just, I tailor back to about an inch and a half per lap. Um, in the spring, um, Guys up our way use it for water management because it's canola, wheat, and potatoes, and everybody knows how much water potatoes take. But other than that, I want to say we're in wheat, we're probably 10 to 12 canola. You're probably 8 to 10, so it, it is somewhat different. You know, you got to remember canola, you know, ripens a little bit sooner than wheat does. Um, a lot of it has to do with Mother Nature too, and. You know, Roy showed some pictures of sclerotania, you know. I don't like to keep that top of that ground wet, you know. I, I like to water it up and then walk away for a while and let that top of that ground dry out so you don't have that, all that humid material underneath that canopy, so. Um, other than that, that's about all I can say. When's my last watering? That's a good question, you know, and everybody's kind of up in the air about it because we, we normally swath of, around the 4th of July, you know, within a few days of that. So our last watering probably is about the 10th to the 15th of June. And if you got the extra water, I may blow an inch of water on just to make sure, you know, it's done flowering, but I'll make sure there's enough there to, for a good pod fill. Plus, I really don't want to introduce too much sclerotinium, you know, that's try to get away with just one treatment. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, the question was uh, on, on planting, and uh, again, I'm going to turn that over to Jeff and let him answer that. You know, Willie, that's a good question. What the, we learned this morning, and I've never seen much of that go on, so, but, you know, it looks like somehow you've got to get a lot of that corn material pushed out of the way with some type of an opener with some some type of this to throw it out of the way that's that's the only way I've seen it you know WSU and they're doing out north of Odessa where they're flying on canola before they harvest the wheat and then the canola seed just goes down through the material and you harvest and you water it up so your canola plant is actually growing in that mulch and I don't know if that would be similar to a corn type deal uh, the only the only problem is is your grow point is exposed and it'll be interesting this winter how how that turns out with that grow point exposed and on the ground. So. But um, corn, that, that's a good question. It'd be something to play with. No-till drill would probably be the way to go. Yeah. 
I mean, there's, there's a lot of different varieties out. Uh, I mean, like I say, there's clear field varieties, there's SU resistant varieties. I mean, everybody seems like everybody's really fighting to get into that in that seed market. So there are a lot of varieties out there. Uh, I have a question for Jeff. What what variety do you feel in, in your area is the best? If you don't have a severe grass problem or anything like that, um, I've always believed in raising varieties of the right to run the best off. So you have a race, it's not a bad thing. You know, the place I'm raising, this would be a year number of those four and a half. Well, I would. No. Just too much. Yeah, that seems that some of those, that one field up there we showed you, the guy made over uh, 4,000 pounds to the acre, and I believe that was with Amanda, wasn't it, Jeff? So Amanda seems to really work good in our area up there. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Hope you got something out of this, and if you have any questions, uh, if you're afraid to ask, just come up and ask me, and we, we have a booth out front. Again, help yourself to all the material that we have out here, and thank you very much.